you're ready. Uh, as ready as I'll ever be. Hi, everyone. Um, that's also me. I'm Yona. I'm a consultant for Olin Data, and in my work, I often find myself explaining the same things over and over again to different clients. As you can imagine, this started frustrating me a little bit, and I wanted to do something about it. So I started creating a list of concepts that I feel are important. I'm going to share a few of these with you today uh, and how they fit together. But since I only have five minutes and a lot of ground to cover, hold on to your seats, because we're in for a ride. So most of us here started out managing relatively traditional setups, usually a database server of some kind and a web server. Managing was done through SSH and manually editing configuration files. When our infrastructures grew, so did our configuration drift along with it. So in an effort to combat this configuration drift, we created configuration management tools. They allow us to make uh, changes to our infrastructure through versionable manifest files. And um, that way we reduce configuration drift a little bit. So um, infrastructure as code is basically the next evolution of this. By defining our complete infrastructure through manifest files, combined with the power of the cloud, you're able to spin up and uh, tear down complete um, environments through the single click of a button. So um, now we have this power, we can start wrapping these in CI CD, uh, we can start building a workflow around this, and this allows us to build our infrastructures in an iterative manner. Um, the moment we start doing this, immutable infrastructure also becomes a really uh, interesting concept because through a single change to a manifest file, basically you generate a completely new artifact. Instead of modifying machines, you end up replacing them uh, instead of modifying them and completely eliminating configuration drift. Oh. So a good example of this is containers. A container is an executable, completely self-sustained package that is generated once from a manifest file and then distributed to multiple environments. Um, that way also completely getting rid of configuration drift again. The good thing about a container is, because it's exactly the same from beginning to end, the code that you're running on a developer machine is in the same environment as it is in your production workload, so hopefully you will never have this problem again. So by completely getting rid of the state in our application and getting rid of configuration drift, all of a sudden we're able to run our applications in parallel, maybe even in uh, an outer scaling manner like this. So with outer scaling groups, Basically, you have uh, a flexible group of servers that you can scale up and scale down depending on certain metrics. Uh, metrics like load or utilization or a certain amount of requests. By doing this, you create robust and flexible infrastructures. With the power of auto-scaling um, in our hands, we can start thinking about more uh, elegant deployment scenarios like blue-green deployments. Most of us in this room remember trying to deploy an application to a server by simply replacing a binary and hoping for the best. Maybe something goes wrong or not. Blue-green is a nice example of this. Essentially, you have two outer scaling groups, one containing the old version of your code and one containing the new with a load balancer in front. After updating the code on one of the outer scaling groups, you change the load balancer, but if anything goes wrong, you can change it back to the previous one. To do these kinds of things, you need some kind of orchestration. Um, most major cloud providers, they give you the tools to build some orchestration yourself, but uh, at some point you want some more advanced features or you want more portability, so other tools are around. These are tools like Nomad and Kubernetes and Mesos and such. Even though they all have their strengths and their differences, usually they work in a relatively similar manner by deploying some kind of a manifest file to your orchestration engine and changes ensue. So now we have this really interesting infrastructure with all kinds of services, but they're not really long-lived anymore. They're ephemeral. So host name-based naming schemes, at some point they will cease to function. Um, tools like console and etcd, they provide an interface for services to register themselves with a health check and uh, query for the details of a different service. If the service goes down for some reason, the health check will fail and it will no longer be returned as healthy. So in building these infrastructures and these services, you need some kind of uh, a method to build these things. Um, you need some help, how to deal with your code base, how to deal with your config, and such. A few years ago, I stumbled on, well, the 12-factor app, which is essentially um, 12 best practices, or factors as they call it, which um, 
tell you how to deal with a lot of uh, common problems, and they allow me to build very scalable and very robust infrastructures. So, well, that's it. Um, I understand that it was only five minutes, so I could only skim the surface, but if you would want to know anything more, please find me after this talk. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Aditya. So the last seven odd years, I've been working with large enterprises, adopting modern ways of working, DevOps, Agile, etc. cetera. Uh, prior to that, I started life as a developer, then moved to Ops, Infra, and then QA, all by accident. And uh, so that's the title. Uh, it's controversial. Ops, as we know, must die. Uh, it's controversial because I wanted it to be, uh, because I think too often we try to sugarcoat the scale of change uh, that our colleagues and peers face, and I think uh, we need to be honest at times. Uh, so this is a good chart to start with. Some of you must have seen it, uh, music revenues. And as you can see over the time, how the formats have changed, right? Some formats have, have just disappeared. Streaming, you know, there's this mountain of compact discs. And uh, you can see how the formats change. And uh, economists call this CD, uh, you know, uh, creative destruction. So you know, different audience here, continuous delivery. but. You can look at these trends uh, even in our own world, right? And you can uh, you can look at other examples that uh, where you can see this theme of uh, creative destruction. And uh, this is Google Trends from about 2004 onwards. As you can see, uh, virtual machines were really the craze back then. Then you can see Docker, serverless, sort of just raising its head now. Uh, I don't know where it, that'll go, pro. So. Uh, the point is, I think, the way we operate is changing, right? And, and in simple terms, obviously, you've got to change the enterprise and run the enterprise. And of course, all enterprises have ma massive transformation initiatives uh, to, ch uh, to transform the way they do things. But uh, shockingly, I think, even those uh, transformation initiatives with the title DevOps still tend to focus on the left-hand side. And, and, and more often, the, the clock is actually ticking on the ops and the infra side, and then it's too late before they even make any change. And uh, here's an example from, uh, from one of the uh, enterprise uh, I've interacted with. So typically, you have engineering teams uh, uh, traditionally dependent on on-premise infrastructure, and they have a fairly complicated uh, request management process. They screamed for cloud, and you know what the leadership did? They went and brought a whole bunch of cloud providers lined up, Seems like the problem solved. Guess what they did next? They cloned the request management process. So what they did was, uh, so now you have to go through a two-month process, even for two minutes of cloud nirvana, right? So, and this is this is happening across enterprises. I can see a few nodding heads. So this this is a this is an issue there, right? So. And there's a few more anti-patterns, so throwing more project managers at the problem, it's a popular thing. Uh, running war rooms, I recognize that security, governance, they're all important things, but sometimes people tend to use them as an excuse to hide behind them. Uh, uh, doing lots of analysis, value stream analysis, flow analysis, assessments, maturity issues, you know, it's, it's almost a cottage industry, right? Uh, the, the, of course, the big thing is then they don't nothing about it, right? They just archive it somewhere, usually on a SharePoint. Uh, and this is my personal favorite, right? There's always someone in the room who says, uh, Aditya, this is really cool stuff, what you're saying, but we are not Netflix, right? So. Uh, I know that Netflix didn't hire me, you hired me, <laughs> for starters. Uh, but then there's some good practices we can learn from you. Uh, I think the point is, I think the scale of change we need to recognize, and there's almost this thing there that people think, oh, you know what, I can duck, the wave will pass, and you know what, there'll be another change program to tomorrow, right? So there's this change fatigue in enterprises that employees experience. It's all not negative, so there are some positive patterns as well. Uh, I think, obviously, you had this all-managed services uh, model around. Now, I think enterprises are now sort of unpicking that, making those services more responsive, making it more transparent. Uh, and then taking it one step forward, uh, the, moving away from the old world of, you know, we are infra, we do everything to sort of decentralizing and federating out uh, these responsibilities back to the engineering teams, especially with uh, cloud-based infrastructure provisioning. So that's, I think it's a good theme. Skills, as a lot of people have spoken today, 
cross, cro cross functional scales, uh, both from left to right, depth to QA to ops, and so on. And of course, insourcing some of the capabilities, right? So there's a, I think there's a trend now to insource some of the critical and business critical and responsive capabilities. Uh, I think ultimately you have, you have to deal with the fact that enterprises will have providers. And if you can have the metrics and the incentives that align their goals, I think that helps a lot. You really can't have a different set of SLAs, if you like, for the build providers and the run. Uh, and uh, one of the final pattern that I like is some organizations are uh, using cloud as, as a disruptor to their own data center capabilities, almost setting it up as a separate organization. I think that, that helps a lot, and it creates competition within the organization. So I want to leave you guys with this old Chinese proverb. I think it's relevant to our times as well. So uh, when the winds of change blow, uh, some people blow, build walls and others build windmills. Thank you. Hi, everyone again. Hi again. Uh, obviously, I am the serverless guy in this conference. Uh, my name is Sarat Jan again. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the DevOps practices and how they apply within serverless environments. So three important things to know about serverless. First, let's define what's serverless. So first one is you don't need to manage or run servers anymore. Uh, you don't even have access to them. And the second important thing is scaling. Your functions should start running in uh, parallel, like if you make more requests. Uh, so obviously, like, it should be, like we talked about this yesterday. Um, they, your functions also are event-driven. This means uh, they, stop, uh, they start and stop executing after some period of time. <coughs> so now, what is not serverless? Well, serverless is not suitable for all types of applications. Serverless is not secure by default. Serverless is not ready for production by default. Serverless is not a silver bullet. So this, uh, and we all want the same thing, right? Just write code, ship it, and repeat. But as you know, that's not the case. And serverless actually removes some of the complexity, but it brings a whole different kind of challenges. And this uh, is a bit old, but still accurate. Uh, we have of obscene service architecture. And the interesting thing here is that the right side is not about the applications, but it's about the tools supporting our applications. So they still exist. And of course, welcome to the continuous integration and continuous delivery world, right? You still kind of need to uh, build your delivery pipeline. And some of the steps in this delivery pipeline will be easier, while some of the steps are, uh, are going to be a lot uh, more difficult. And normally we write a test like unit tests, integration, acceptance, security tests, and the value of acceptance and integration tests are higher than ever within serverless environments because there are so many moving pieces. And of course deployments, uh, just because we are in serverless, that doesn't mean that we don't need deployment. We still need to package our application and upload it to the cloud provider, the specific format they want. And actually, there are different tools like serverless.js that's uh, focusing on this problem. And normally, we use techniques like blue-green deployment or canary releases to update our code in production. And actually, you can do that within serverless environments as well. There are uh, support for versioning and aliasing uh, that allows you to uh, deploy uh, in production safely. Smart move? No, right? So uh, the only way you don't experience production problems, obviously, if you never ship your code. And I'm assuming you will ship your code. That means you need to be prepared for incidents. And that is why you need observability. Well, to be able to answer tough questions, you need to understand your systems. And just because you are running in serverless environment, that doesn't mean you have observability by default. And of course, when we are talking about observability, we need to talk about logs. And uh, logs are relatively easy to write using uh, if you use cloud, uh, cloud providers' default services, but they are often not easy to operate. So you might end up building your own solution or using a third-party tool. So you, are, you have still a lot to worry about that. And also, you, uh, in serverless environments, you need visibility between your functions. This means you need some sort of distributed tracing. And actually, there are new services popping up. For example, AWS uh, introduced new X-ray service last year. 
And just like we talked yesterday, serverless providers give you some metrics, error counts, durations, uh, those are great, but they are not enough. You need to know what is going on inside your functions, and that is not easy at all. And just like we do normally, uh, we, uh, we still need to put our people in the on-call schedules. Maybe this time we, uh, we uh, have to actually put uh, our developers in the on-call schedules, but still we need to put uh, people in the on-call schedules, we need to uh, respond to critical incidents, that's not changing as well. And security is always a must. You still need to assign proper roles to your functions. You need to uh, put your functions in a VPC and restrict access to them. You need to manage your keys and uh, everything. Uh, there, there are still a bunch of things to do with uh, security. And also, uh, just like I'll talk about it, there, there's something called cold start. It means there's a latency when a new container is created. So uh, again, this, this might be a problem for you. We open source our solution, by the way. You can check it out if you want. So serverless is a great environment for certain kinds of applications, and but you still need to build your delivery pipeline. You still need to, you need observability to answer these tough questions. And it's clear that serverless is a different kind of DevOps. But the although the challenges are changing, DevOps is not going anywhere anytime soon. Thank you. Yep, that's me. Savometer, what's that about? Um, I'll shortly uh, dive into uh, what, it, what psychological safety is and why it uh, matters, according to my opinion. But uh, let me first uh, introduce myself. I live in the beautiful city of The Hague, together with my uh, lovely wife, Andy. We have two daughters, Ricky and Lex. Uh, a dog as well, named Ulrich. And uh, I'm a scrum master at uh, Dutch Railways. So there's a lot I could talk about uh, what is going on in Dutch railways, how many trains we have, how many passengers, but for now I think it's very relevant that we're on a journey towards responding faster to uh, all kinds of changes on, uh, in the world. And uh, those uh, changes, uh, we try to deal with them in a uh, human and in a customer-centered way. So we uh, would like to um, know what customers really want and then uh, we might start serving tea as, uh, as a conductor. Um, and at the same time, what do our uh, people in Dev and Ops need to, um, to satisfy those customers' uh, challenges? And what should we do? Um, what kind of environment should we create in order for them to be successful? Well, um, Martijn van Asseldonk and I, uh, we together uh, created a format called the Safeometer because we found out that psychological safety is uh, one of the most important aspects when it comes to high performing uh, teams. That is also supported by a big uh, research project at Google named uh, Project Aristoteles. Uh, five dynamics are uh, mentioned and psychological safety is by far the most important uh, aspect on that. Um, when it comes to psychological safety, there's a big authority in that field of research. That's uh, Professor Amy Edmondson. There's a great TED talk of hers, uh, some 11 minutes in which she completely uh, dives into uh, what it is, how can you uh, foster it, how can you assess it. And she also states the difference between psychological safety on one hand and motivation on the other hand. And you could compare that to um, motivation is like when you push the gas pedal and uh, psychological safety is like you uh, release the brake. So what could leaders do um, in order to assess and foster a psychological safety in their department or um, in their teams? Uh, a lot of things, and uh, one of the items uh, Amy Edmondson created was a big questionnaire that uh, you could uh, send out to your entire department, and uh, if you answer all those questions, and everybody does so, then eventually you get an overview of how safe things are uh, considered by people. Um, there are, there's a downside to 
to that, according to me, um, another questionnaire that had us a big overlap with the trust level of Patrick Lencioni's uh, five dysfunctions of a team. Uh, he ha created a, a questionnaire as well. But what Martijn and I were looking for was something else. We needed something more interactive because we believe that through interaction, uh, people uh, get a common view of uh, how they are and they can are able to respond to each other. So how to create that, uh, what we basically did was we took uh, some of the statements uh, from Lencioni and Edmondson and we made them slightly more personal and we created a counterpart for each of those uh, statements. And uh, yeah, you s just see some examples of that. So red is unsafe, green is safe. And um, this is how the workshop actually uh, works. So you create an unsafe and a safe part on, uh, on a whiteboard, for instance. Uh, put a statement on the left and on the right and then invite people to, um, well, just to uh, place themselves somewhere more to safe or unsafe. Um, what happens then is that uh, you ask people to elaborate on uh, why do you place yourself uh, where you did. And then a uh, discussion can uh, start. What I found really uh, exciting the first couple of times I, I uh, did this workshop was that um, how will people respond and uh, will they uh, be able to talk about stuff like this? And the striking thing is that uh, people appear to be very open about uh, how safe they feel or unsafe they feel and depending on um, on their unsafety feeling, they are still able to express why they feel unsafe and what makes them feel unsafe. So that I can imagine um, unsafety might prevent you to, to be honest, but so far um, I haven't experienced that. This is about spin-offs. Yeah? So Melrose Place was a spin-off of uh, Beverly Hills 90210, as we all uh, might know. Um, there is uh, there's some spin-off potential here as well uh, because uh, we would like to uh, try to do this in a bigger team of teams setting as well. Uh, for now, I thank you for your attention and uh, if you want to know more, just contact me. Thank you.